And we're really delighted to welcome Sarah here this evening. Um, LHHP um, has a market in Sonoy on a Saturday morning that if you remember you can sell your stuff at your, your produce. It's 25 quid a year. Um, increasingly we're trying to do stuff like this, get people growing, um, joining that kind of general groundswell of local food production, good food, organic food, um, low miles food. Um, you're probably aware that the, the government, that the Scottish government has the, the National Good Food Plan that they're consulting on at the moment. Um, it's the only country in the UK that has such a thing. Um, as part of that, there will be opportunities within Park itself to, to work together in some form or another um, for producers, um, possibly even to sell stuff. We'll be looking at maybe doing some, some market research to see what people want to eat and therefore what we want to grow. So that's all coming down the line. That's quite exciting. But obviously we're starting from, from the beginning, from basics. So tonight Sarah's going to talk to us as an introduction on growing here in, in the Outer Hebrides. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Chris. Hi guys, as Toys introduced now, I'm Sarah, <laughs> the one and only. Um, Chris had it in a nutshell there, I'm um, with the LHHP. We are trying to encourage the growth of more food on Lewis and Harris and indeed throughout the entire Hebrides um, for a myriad of reasons. Environmental, well, throw a dart at a map <laughs> and it's a good reason to grow more food. Um, the islands in the recent years have become increasingly reliant on a relatively unreliable food transportation system. So for all that we're one of the more affluent areas in Scotland, we actually have some of the worst food insecurity. So if we don't have to bring it over the minch, it's just one less, one less link to, to ultimately be broken, probably. Now, this evening we're going to be talking about, well, as you can see, an introduction to growing produce in the edge of Hebrides. We do face our own unique challenges up here. It's not impossible to grow food in the edge of Hebrides. This is a wild rumour spread by manufacturers of polycrops. You can grow food in the Outer Hebrides, but we do have our own unique challenges, all of which you can overcome. And I would argue that everywhere in the, everywhere in the world, every growing area in the world has their own unique challenges to be overcome. So don't be put off. Um, the weather's doing a really good job today of proving me wrong because it's like screaming wind and I'm like, it's great, it's great, everything's going to be great. Um, but it can be done. This evening, we, because we don't know who comes to these seminars, some of this might seem a little bit basic. But because we are, we have to start somewhere, we, have, we might have some champion growers in our midst and we might have someone who could kill a cacti. So we're going to start from the beginning. Uh, hopefully we'll come back again. We've got some more specific seminars to give, polycrops, composting, raised beds and all sorts of stuff like that. But tonight is just an overview and an introduction, as we said, to growing produce in the Hebrides. Um, before I kick off in earnest, I got taken down by that really nasty cold that's been going around last week and it is currently in my ears. So if I feel like I'm underwater, so if at any point I'm whispering or screaming at you, somebody tell me because I have no gauge of volume right now. So give me a shout, I'm, I'm not a sensitive wee soul. You can, you can be like, Sarah, calm down. Like, or we can't hear you, you're whispering. Um, yeah, I've got absolutely no idea of my volume right now. So just having said that, I'm not infectious. It was last week, it's just hanging around. Um, all right, so. Without further ado, we'll kick off into an introduction of growing in the Outer Hebrides. She said, very confidently, not using the new toy very well. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so, uh, not to start on the negative, but there are challenges to overcome on Lewis, Harris, Uist, Barra, everywhere in the Outer Hebrides. These are some of the more common ones, and we're going to take a little look at them in a bit more detail. So we've got the ever-present Hebridean breeze which for various reasons can pose a challenge when growing produce, whether that's pollination and losing all your flowers before they get a chance to become fruit, or just wind burn on everything. The wind is not our ally. Um, due to how far north we are, we have a relatively short growing season. So we have to be pretty clever about what we choose to grow, or we have to extend the growing season using man-made options, which is also an option. Um, our soil pH obviously tends acidic, generally speaking, um, and that's a consideration as well because some things, with all the love in the world, will prefer alkali soil. So if you are determined to grow something that was alkali, you might have to address your soil a little bit. Um, and pests. Now there should be a third one there. Deer, rabbits and geese are our main <laughs> ones up here. 
um, as far as plants go anyway, and as far as gardeners go, you have to be slightly willing to be eaten alive by midges, but we'll get to that as well. Um, so if we crack on. So in the Outer Hebrides, as we have daily proof, um, quite a breezy place, quite a windy place, especially last week, um, my potatoes were flung gaily across the lawn by Kathleen, so they'd have to start again. Um, yeah, so most produce, although there's a hardy produce as well, but most produce will require some form of protection from the breezes that we get up here. Um, a windbreak and such. Now there's two, you can break your windbreaks into two variants. You've got man-made or you've got natural. So natural is your shelter belts, your hedges and stuff like that. Your man-made are, I mean, you see, you'll see the green netting everywhere, that's a windbreak. Um, people just make full-on fences that are very tight gaps, that's a windbreak. And up here, the wind is so prevalent that you may actually find you need a man-made windbreak in order to grow a natural windbreak. Um, quite a lot of your, your hedging and whatnot, unless you want a windbreak growing at 45 degrees, you might, you might be better to uh, get a windbreak in place before you even try to grow one. Um, ideally, I would say for my money, uh, the natural ones are going to be better. Anything, anything man-made, anything created will eventually break. Um, but yes, you will need to get one in place to get your natural windbreak on the go. Um, they're relatively, in terms of sweat equity, not hard to put up. They're quite cheap to put up if you use their green netting or their black netting, and it's definitely worthwhile. Um, one thing about windbreaks is, counterintuitively, you don't actually want them to completely block the wind. So something like a wall, which everyone thinks is the best of the best because you're blocking everything, is actually not ideal. You want a semi-permeable windbreak. We are looking to slow the wind down as it comes through. We're not looking to stop it entirely. Because where you stop the wind entirely, you're actually now creating a space for it to come back on itself and make what's called eddies, and you're making the problem worse. Um, that to say, if you have walls in your garden and your crop or anything like that, don't knock them down and put up a windbreak. Uh, better a wall than no windbreak. So yeah, very fond of using what we have. Um, but if you are looking to put up a windbreak, semi-permeable is what you're looking to do. We're looking to slow down these gusts, not stop them altogether. Because that's a fight you're not going to win. You're never going to win that. Um, a big tip with these sort of things is uh, leaving your ego at the door. You're, you're not going to win against the wind. But you can work around it. Um, I've got a far better diagram than I could ever describe of why we're not looking for a solid windbreak. We're looking for a semi-permeable one. So, for instance, I've got a south-facing house and I've got a wall to the front of the house. I'm not going to knock it down to put up a semi-permeable one because that's just daft. But my wall will be creating these eddy areas, which is not ideal. If that were semi-permeable, the wind would actually continue, but it would slow it right down, which is the ideal outcome we're looking for for a windbreak. Wind is a good consideration because, like I said, either it will burn your plants, it will burn any plant. Wind burn is a nightmare or it will stop your produce from forming before it even has a chance. So the, I've had the most beautiful blossoms on my apple trees for a couple of years in a row now, and that's all I get because Hebridean breeze comes through or Kathleen comes through and off go the blossoms and with it any chance of any fruit. Um, so windbreaks are definitely, I would say, your number one consideration before you look at your soil even. I would be looking at getting windbreak up around where you want to grow. And that's a point as well, only around where you want to grow. Because I've given a few of these seminars now and I get similar questions at each one. And one was, oh, you know, you said it's not very expensive. I, I, I've got an acre and a half worth of garden. It's like, wow, are you planting an acre and a half? Well, no. Then why are you windbreaking it? You can, it's your garden. You can just windbreak off your veg patch. You can just windbreak off your fruit patch. You don't need to have a completely protected uh, entirety of your garden. Um, decide what you're planting and where, or where you can plant, and go from there. Um, for my money, that would be in the Hebrides, that's your first consideration if you're going to be growing produce, is get some protection from the wind. Anything, anything at all. Short growing season. So, we're all familiar with the Hebridean summer, and this sometimes surprises people because, you know, for a solid four weeks there, we'll be getting 18, 20 hours of daylight. A dream, a dream of many growers everywhere. But it doesn't last, it doesn't last long at all. We are so far north that our growing season is short. Um, 
there's, there's no way of, again, leave your ego at the door, you're not going to win against that. That just is the way it is. We have a couple of options here. Um, we can either choose to grow produce with a relatively rapid sort of turnaround. So I would say most things like a 16 week turnaround from germination to providing fruit or veg. Um, succession planting. I've never personally had success with that. Succession planting is I've planted a row of potatoes here, I've harvested them, I'm immediately going to plant peas and hope to get two for the price of one within one season. Our season is so short, if you can do it, hats off to you. I've never had much luck doing that, um, but it's definitely, you know, it's worth, might be worth a go. And our third option, which you'll see a lot of, is to kind of, not fake's not the word I'm looking for, artificially, artificially extend the growing season. And there's multiple ways of doing this. I'm doing it right now by starting my seeds on the windowsill. I'm starting them under glass. So they're getting a fighting chance before they would ever have half a chance out there. Hopefully I'll have some plants to put out in a few weeks that would not, that they wouldn't even have germinated in the, how cold the soil still is. And that's just one way of doing that. Um, if any of you have got a greenhouse, a polytunnel, a polycrub, a cold frame, if anyone's ever stuck a cut off plastic bottle over a plant in the ground, you've just extended your growing season because you've created a microclimate in there and you've extended, you know, you've, you'll be able to make that plant a bit more productive a bit earlier than you would without having done that. So for my money, the two main options there are choose things that have a relatively rapid turnaround and extend artificially extend your growing season, uh, get around it that way. Let's see. I'll touch on this briefly, I'm not going to get too much into it because I feel like you can get into the minutia of stuff like this and people, people love to get into the minutia of stuff like this. Generally speaking, soil on Lewis and Harris is going to tend as if we're peatland. Generally speaking, there will be alkali pockets here and there. Um, you can test your soil to find out what it is. You can get these quite cheap testing kits. I would say 9 out of 10 of us will have alkali soil. Um, so you might want to, you know, in terms of just getting started with growing produce, I would always, I would always advise that we go for the safe bets before we go for things that are a risk. If you were trying to grow something that prefers alkali soil on the Isle of Lewis, it, you might not have much success. And not having much success tends to make people disheartened, tends to make you give up, and you've probably just spent at least 100 quid or 50 quid or whatever you've spent to just get really annoyed. <laughs> and, um, so for my money, I would, I would be looking for things that do well in acidic soil rather than trying to fight with it. Um, if you want to fight with it, you can absolutely dress your soil. You can add things to make it more acidic. You can add things to make it more alkali. 100% you can, and Google is your friend there. Plenty of people do. Anyone that puts lye on the croft is changing the pH to more alkali. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, once you've established the kind of soil that you have, I would personally, I would be looking to plant crops that you know are going to thrive in that. So potatoes like acidic soil, legal acidic soil. Um, there's a reason potatoes are a staple here and in Ireland. Um, they tend to do well, they like it. Blueberries, love it, love life. Um, maybe just stay away from the more alkali stuff in the beginning would be my advice, but don't let me tell you how to live your life. <laughs> you do what you want to do. Um, so yeah, for all of us starting out, that would be my advice, to choose things that naturally will hopefully do well, um, make your life easier, especially when you're first getting started out. There's time to try and grow anything you like. There's time to, I mean, personally in my tunnel this year, I'm hoping to grow sugar baby watermelons that are about this big. Uh, that's my weird thing for the year. But um, and if, when you're starting out, certainly go for your staples, go for your things that are gonna do well. Hedge. It's like, you know, bet on yourself, really. <laughs> Make your life easier. Let's see. Pest. Now, I promise this whole, this whole presentation isn't negative. We're just covering the things that we're going to have to overcome. Um, deer, rabbits, and invisibly there it says geese. These are certainly where I am in Lurbos, in North Lox. These are our major ones. I imagine it's the same down here. Deer, yeah. Um, and again, it sounds like I'm being really negative, but every zone in the world has pest challenges and we all just have to overcome what we have. It's, we don't have gophers, and we don't have groundhogs, and we don't have capybara, but we have got deer, and we have got rabbits, and we have got geese. Um, and for my money, a physical barrier is always going to be 
the best thing you can do. You will see on the internet all kinds of weird and wonderful methods to keep deer off your garden, the oddest of which I've ever seen was human hair. Apparently if you can spread human hair around your garden, I don't know what anyone was doing when they found this out. Um, apparently just the scent of human will keep them off your garden. I have pulled the curtains on my living room and been faced with a stag who just looks at me like, oh yeah. So if he doesn't care that I'm there, I don't think he's going to care that my hair cuttings are there. Um, but you'll find everything. You'll find neem spray and chili spray and garlic spray and all kinds of very weird and wonderful things. Um, I've never had luck with any of them myself. A good fence is what I've had luck with. Um, obviously deer will make short work of fences that are any shorter than I am. And in that case, what I've had really good luck with um, is apparently deer don't like to jump when they can't see what's on the other side. Um, they're very, they're, they're cautious about things like that. So if you can do something like a dead hedge um, or a proper hedge, even better, or even just any kind of barrier on the other side of your fence, just something to keep the deer, deer armed. <laughs> deer are a topic in locks. Um, Rabbits, the advice to keep rabbits out in Lewis and Harris is going to be the same advice as to keep rabbits out anywhere in the world. Um, line your waste beds if you possibly can. Uh, I don't, have you got an issue with rabbits down here? Not so much. I've only got two or three in the crop and I've never seen them. I've got thousands. Them. You've got thousands? <laughs> okay. Right, nobody go near his craft. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, if you're doing raised beds, then chicken wire across the bottom is a great idea. Sinking rabbit fence into the ground, obviously, it's, it's hard work, but the sweat equity will pay off um, in the end for your rabbits. And geese, which I think is another island-wide issue, or it certainly is in the North Wales anyway. Um, geese, geese are a particular pain because obviously they attack from the air, and <laughs> your usual efforts are just useless against them. Um, one of our board members, Matt, swears blind that geese can smell new potatoes in the earth. Because he, um, he did a, you know, an acre of, of potatoes last year and he could swear down that they could just pinpoint it and come straight in and take it and leave. Uh, but he had great luck just stringing wire across his plot. And then I think a really common one is broken CDs or anything that will flutter or reflect the light. But just the wire itself, it's kind of the same as the deer, they don't like to land where there's nothing, you know, where there's, it's not safe to land effectively. Um, the only issue there is they can also walk, so they might land 20 feet away. Um, so yeah, those are your main ones. There's, I'm sure there's, there's the usual ones as well, there's slugs, snails, uh, centipedes even. Um, I've got a real issue with earwigs. I had no idea earwigs were a garden pest until I moved here. Um, dealing with all these kind of pests is the same here as it is in Devon, as it is in Barcelona. All the advice is going to be the same. So we're going to keep it vaguely, well actually no, we're going to keep it specifically Hebridean um, and talk about the specific issues that we face with. But we'll have a Q&A at the end and if anyone's got a wonderful method of keeping slugs off the lettuce, do let me know. Because mine just get drunk and come back and my ear traps. Um, I've got the best slug bar in locks. So, that's all the negative stuff and we've got that out of the way now. It's not all negative, I promise. Those are your main challenges and they are all surmountable. There's nothing that can stop you growing food if you would like to grow food. Um, to get started, choosing your growing site is your first thing that you're gonna do. After you've got your windbreak up, this is, that's the first thing you're gonna do. This is the second thing you're gonna do. Um, no, choose your growing site and that'll be different for all of you. I can give objective advice and I can speak to any of you individually about what kind of site you have but that is going to be different for all of you. My house is completely exposed and faces south, and that might not be true of all of you. I'm bang into the, uh, into the prevailing wind where we are, and that won't be true of all of you. So have a little look around your site and see if you can find, have you got naturally occurring windbreak? Um, if you do, does it also block the sun and is it no good now? You know, have a look around your site and see what you're working with. Um, once you've chosen physically where you'd like to be, there's various different ways of getting started. You can do very traditional tilled beds. You can do even more traditional than that and do raised beds. Uh, sorry, lazy beds. Um, no dig beds are having an absolute moment at the at present. Charles Dowding has made them very popular. I do believe they did exist before he did, but in kind of a horticultural influencer kind of way. He's like, I've invented this. Like, no, you haven't. <laughs> That's been around for 60 years, but okay. 
Uh, no dig beds are really cool. That just, as it sounds, you are not digging, you're not disturbing the soil structure, you're not disturbing the little life forms and microbes in the soil. Um, and it's, yeah, there's, there's less, there's less work in, well, <laughs> you, two might, you, you two might hate me if I say there's less work involved. There is still work involved. Um, but a no dig bed consists of usually putting down a very thick layer of cardboard, two or three, <coughs> to wash out the weeds and squash out the grass. A layer of something that will break down is usually handy, seaweed, rotten manure, something like that. Compost on top of that and hey presto, you've got a garden bed. Um, much, much more pleasant I think than having to dig and apparently much better than having to dig because you haven't disturbed the life, you haven't disturbed the microbes, you haven't destroyed the soil structure um, and you haven't woken up the weed seeds because weed seeds love earth that gets turned over because it brings them up. Um, other options are raised beds, of which there are thousands of different types. You know, you've got your beautiful, elegant, large type ones. You've got cobbled together um, breeze block ones that I've got that I found in the craft. Uh, and anything in between. If you can create an area to grow in, you've created a raised bed. Um, and planters and containers definitely have their place, especially up here. Um, a lot of things will grow really well in a planter and container. Blueberries will grow really well. And when things like Kathleen come round, you can weave them inside, you can weave them around the corner, you can put them in the shed. Um, so planters and containers, definitely, even if you have a huge garden, it's not just for balconies, you've, they've definitely got their place in your garden as well. Okay, this is something I get asked all the time, what, what, what should I grow, what should I grow? I said, well, what do you eat? What do you like to eat? <laughs> I could sit here and be like, grow radishes, and you might hate radishes. Um, but when you're starting out, like I said before about the soil pH, I would advise that you stick with things that are known to work well on Lewis because there's nothing worse than putting all this effort and all this love into something and having it all die. <laughs> there is just, oh, it's so heartbreaking. These, I've got a list here, and these are staples, I would say. Um, I won't run, I, I, you can all read, I wouldn't run through the whole list, but this is not an exhaustive list, this is... The list I have here are things that I have grown outside with no polycrop, no polytunnel, no cloche and very little wind protection as well because it took me a couple of years to realise I should probably have got wind protection. Um, potatoes are obviously going to do really well. Turnips, kale, cabbage, uh, peas, beans, onions, strawberries, blackberries, raspberries. That's just my list. That's not exhaustive because in other seminars I've had people be like, I thought, I thought carrots would grow really well. I was like, yes they do, but I don't like growing them, so I've not grown them. Um, my carrots always fork. Um, these, this is just a, an example of what can easily grow really well outside in the Hebrides. You don't need to spend 20 grand on a polygrub. You don't need to spend 20 quid on a cloche if you don't want to. This is things I've grown just in the veg plot in my garden. Um, and they've done well, done really well. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a polygrub or a polytunnel, and don't get me wrong, I'm not. Uh, speaking negatively of them at all, I'm desperate for one, it's probably envy that makes me speak the way I do, um, then this list gets so much longer. But starting from scratch, if you just have some bare croft, these will all grow perfectly happily outside and they will, they should thrive. Uh, but again, it's up to you. What do you like to eat? I can't sit here and be like, you should grow a ton of potatoes if you don't like potatoes. <laughs> um, the wider conversation on what we're recommending people to grow kind of feeds into the whole initiative of trying to get people to grow to scale, to hopefully sell in the local communities and or barter or anything like that. In that case, I would I would have some things to recommend that you that you uh, grow if you're growing to sell. But it's mostly going to be the same as this. It's going to be staples. It's going to be potatoes, turnips, carrots. It's going to be your dare I say your usual. You know what what most people would usually have in their kitchen if you were growing to sell. That's what I would recommend that you would grow. But if you're just get, kicking off, grow what you like, grow what you like to eat, grow what's usually in your kitchen. We've already done that one. Now this this is um, just for a little bit of inspiration. Um, we This is John Hamilton's Croft at 44 Ranish. A really cool enterprise. And he's actually, through this whole endeavour, he's doing a Croft tour this Saturday. Completely welcome to anyone. Anyone that would like to come along, please do. Um, we're just going to have a little walk around the croft. He's going to tell us all about, he took it from a beer land croft 
to effective, well, not effectively, an actual fantastically productive market garden. Um, he supplies customers direct and he also has a little honesty box, but he's, this has taken off so much for him that he could now do this as his living. He grows vegetables and makes a living off it, which is incredible. Um, under these cloches, John has courgettes, which I find incredible. He's got his beans here, these are his pea sticks, obviously this is potatoes, and you can see John, <laughs> he calls this his, uh, his two-tone windbreak, and if, if he tries to convince you it was on purpose, he's lying, because he, uh, he put it up to this side and realised it wasn't high enough, so he stuck it up higher, um, and it wasn't on purpose, <laughs> and I'm going to dob him right in it. Um, but yeah, this is just some proof of to what will grow, and grow incredibly well in the heavy. This was bare land when John took it over, and now it took over about six years ago, this didn't happen overnight, but a lot of it kind of did. <laughs> like, he opened up the beds really quickly. Um, he uses quite traditional methods. He had a trailer, and you'll often see him down at Ranish on the beach collecting seaweed, because he uses an awful lot of seaweed to feed his soil and for mulch and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I've included these just as kind of proof to show you that I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm not pulling these uh, facts and lists and all that out of thin air. This is, this is just up the road in Ranish, and on a fairly exposed site as well. John's on top of a hill. Um, and what he's done is incredible. So if anyone would like to come along to have a look at the enterprise and he'll give us a little talk on you know, how he did it, what would he do if he was doing it again, what would he not do if he were doing it again. Um, the more the merrier, you're all welcome. Half past nine, 44 Ranish, no charge, we're all just turning up. Wear wellies, do wear wellies. I did not, learn from me. <laughs> um, I think the next one's John's as well. No, that was, uh, there's an aerial shot of John. John's got, about four of these beds now. And yeah, it's his living. So I promise what I'm saying is accurate. You can grow vegetables in the edge of head these without a polycrub and without a polytunnel. Um, they, they make it easier, but they're not necessary. Um, he's taken a, a bare land, disused croft and turned it into something really quite profitable um, for one, because everyone needs to make money, but just what he's doing is incredible. Um, so, in terms of getting started, I think that's about all I've got prepared, but we usually have a bit of a chat and questions and whatnot after these. Um, so, yeah, has anyone got any questions or points of conversation? I saw you had uh, strawberries that are growing outside. Yes. Do they, I've never tried growing them outside, do they grow quite successfully? Very well, yes. My. What, what I'm pleased to call my strawberry planter is an old fish box that I found on the croft. Um, I've got, well I started with six strawberry plants but I wasn't very good at nipping out the runners so now I've got about 16 strawberry plants yeah. in there and they do great, they do really well. Uh, first year I wasn't, I wasn't on top of the mulching as much as I should have been so I definitely lost some to, you know, just where it's touched the earth and they got wet. Yeah. But no, mine grow, mine grow really well and they're just at the front of my house, they, because my planter is quite low it doesn't seem, you know, the wind just seems to go up and over it and it doesn't seem to get bothered by much. So yeah, strawberries 100% will grow outside. Yeah. Yeah. If you watch the birds. Um, I have a couple of little questions. Yeah. You mentioned the geese yeah. and the chat with the potatoes. Do they eat the potatoes? Yes. Yeah, I learned that too. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah, yeah, he'll swear down that they were just coming straight from the air, and then when he put his wire across, they were landing about twenty feet away mm. and walking directly to the side of his little furrows and just sticking them beak up. straight in. Wow, out the new that's really interesting. I guess I had seen this was just reading about grey light geese because I'm cool. Um, uh, it's a learned behaviour. They discovered them doing it, I think, in the north of England somewhere. Um, and it's just sort of spread out from one nucleus point. I'm so, going to tell that. Yeah. <laughs> he's, not, he's not mad. I'm going to tell that. Indication. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. um, That's so interesting. And the other one was um, peas and beans. Mm. We got some raw beans for this year with the idea that we thought, um, and they were no, Scottish, or, or at least a variety grown in Scotland, so we were like, cool, they should do okay. But I, I really like peas, but I kind of assumed everything I'd grown so far would be too tall and that the wind would, you know, damage the pots. Mm. Um, how do you grow peas to kind of avoid that, or is it just a wind break? So, because there was some on, yeah, on Ranish, wasn't there? I think yeah, it was on the right. Yep, yeah, they're just here, peas are just here, and peas, in order to stop them, so peas, yeah, they, they do grow tall. 
Um, in order to stop them, the wind getting to them, you'll see John's got his pea sticks up here and he's got a trellis between them. They need something to climb. Mm. Um, for my money, when I'm growing peas in the garden, I actually just grow them along my garden fence. Um, Use what you've already got. I'm very into using what you've already got. Uh, broke crofter. So, um, yeah, they need to climb something and they actually, peas will send out tendrils, which look like nothing at all, but they are stupid strong. Mm. And once they grab onto whatever you've provided them to grow up, beans are the same, they're climbers. Mm. Um, so for all that, yeah, I mean, if, if I hear a plant's going to be over three feet, I'm probably not going to try and grow it in Hebrides without mm. making it climb up something. But, but it's, if, it's, if it's attached, it'll, it'll be okay. Yeah, because yeah. They, they attach at multiple points as well. Mm. So even if the wind manages to get one of the tendrils off, which it won't because they spin round and round, at the end of the season when you're trying to get them off the pea sticks, it's a nightmare. Um, but yeah, that's that's your answer there. Grow them up something and give them something to hang on to and the wind... Again, I would still recommend a wind break of some sort. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Any other questions, queries, comments? Yeah. Apart from the soil being acidic, mm -hmm. uh, it's very heavy too yes. where I am. So a lot of people talking about mixing some sand in and that kind of thing. Is yeah. that worthwhile, or does that come under the? No, choose something which will grow happily with what you've got. In the case of very heavy soil, I don't. I, I would be looking to lighten it up a little bit for yeah. sure. Yeah, so sand's great. Um, I'm putting, for the first time in my garden while well, I've had it, I'm reopening some lazy beds this year. I'm going to be doing the traditional put a line of seaweed down oh, and nice. flip it over. Um, it was used widely and for a long time because it works and because you do need to feed the soil something. And seaweed is fantastic, it's freely available. Um, it's, it's balanced, a lot of things that people add to their soil are not balanced, so you'll add too much nitrogen or you'll add too much something or other. Um, seaweed has got 58 trace minerals but they're in decent balance, so you can just whack it on. <laughs> um, so yes, in terms of very heavy, clay, wet potentially yes. soil, yeah, um, lazy beds were a fantastic option because it raises up where you're growing creates automatic drainage either side because you sure. flipped it up. Um, yeah, traditional <laughs> for a reason, yeah. But yeah, I was We found on our crop the, the existing old lazy beds are an immediate source of the best soil. Yes, um, of course. It's literally eight <coughs> inches and feet deep. Fantastic. Of brilliant soil. Um, just unheard of, the we, Lewis. <laughs> we did nothing with it, just put some potatoes, we didn't even dig it, just put some Push some potatoes into it. Mm -hmm. um, it's great. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, so it's been built up for gosh knows how long it's been built up for the soil in these lazy beds. So, well, if 18 inches down, you'll find sand in it. Yeah. So, it's been cultivated for generations and, yeah. and just left and just, just yeah. reuse it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm all about that. As you might, there's a theme in a lot of my seminars about using what you have before you go out and spend a fortune. Because inevitably, with all them, maybe we don't all, maybe all your crofts are very tidy. Mm -hmm. I bought a very untidy croft with a myriad of weird stuff to find. Um, but it's all usable in weird and wonderful ways. And yeah, definitely, if you've got some old lazy beds anywhere on your croft or in the garden, I would be looking at using them for sure. Yeah. Do you have to be careful what kind of sand you use? Uh, personally, I would just grab sand off the beach, I think. Yeah. And like builder sand, you know, is that different from what you get off the beach? I have no idea, Chris, is that different from what we get off the beach? <laughs> um, <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> well, it's very good shop sand, yeah. it's different somehow, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm an absolute freegan, so I wouldn't be buying sand, I'd be going to the beach and yeah. no doubt leaving half of it in my car. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm afraid personally I don't know the answer to that, um, but I'll look it up. I thought that was frowned upon these days. Stealing you know? sand. Yes. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I think you're allowed to do it, but with some sort of permit. Oh, okay. You need to, you know, you need to, yeah. Do you technically do you take like too much seaweed? Or was it seaweed for consumption, technically? That's what I, I mean, yeah. It's, it's only about, if you do it on the floor, sure, it's crown probably, but whether you actually apply it to a license, I think is yeah. rare. I, I think it, yeah. No, 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 I personally, I've, I've, I've availed myself of a lot of seaweed over the years, um, and I've never been caught by the boys in blue. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, if the amount of cars they're letting drive around up here with no insurance and MOTs, if me taking seaweed is on their list, then I'm not paying tax <laughs> anymore, frankly. <laughs> Any other? I was, I was using some sand that I managed to forage from uh, the local community as well, but it was mainly um, it was mainly shells. I mean, sand it is, obviously, but like this was quite intense shells, like, you know, mustard shells that were still kind of the same size. And I hadn't really, I hadn't really thought about whether or not it would be better or worse. I just imagined, okay, well, it's draining and it's calcium. It's calcium, yeah. But like, it, is it going to be too salty or anything like that? This comes up a lot. Um, yeah. I get this asked a lot with seaweed as well. People ask if we should rinse our seaweed and whatnot. Um, personally, I never have, and I've never seen any ill effects. I think any salt that is, or well, rather the salt that is present within the seaweed, um, we're not strangers to rain up here. Obviously, it's going to get washed off. And yes, it's going to get washed off into your soil. Um, for my money, I've never seen any problems with it. And I would, I would imagine the same would be true of the sand. Again, personally, I've never seen any problems with it. Um, one thing I would consider in that is just that, like how long they did it for up here, prior to prior to any of us being thought of. Um, I don't think they were rinsing their seaweed because I initially <laughs> I've, I've got money, right. Um, I've got a river that goes through my croft, and I was oh, I was oh so virtuous. I was going to rinse all my seaweed because I've got a river in my croft, and then one go with that, I was actually I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, and yeah, I've never had any ill effects, so I wouldn't too worry. I wouldn't worry too much about the salt content, um, because realistically, with the gales we get and whatnot, and how close we are to the sea, we're constantly getting battered by salt spray anyway. Um, so I'm not worrying about adding a little bit more myself. But this is going to go out on the internet, and somebody somewhere will. <laughs> <laughs> somebody will comment. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Or so yeah. we're, we're hilariously inept. Um, we seem to like wake up one morning in the spring, um, so we ran out and threw cardboard everywhere and expensive compost and caffeine dumped most of it into the loft last week. But <laughs> when when do people start here? And that's a silly question. No, not at all. Um, because the majority of people that come to these seminars tend to be people who've moved here. We notice mm -hmm. myself included giving the seminar. Um, the standard sort of wisdom I've heard is you lose a month on either end of your growing season up here. So anything you would have started at the beginning of April on the mainland, you are not looking at until the beginning of May. And that is you know, transferable. Anything you would have started mid-March, start in April, so on and so forth. Um, that's true of growing anything outside. If you have the methods to extend your growing season, and again, that is as simple as putting your seeds on the windowsill to get them going, then obviously that doesn't apply because you've got your own little microclimate now and the Hebrides can can suck eggs as far as you know ruining your plans because you've done them too early because you're indoors. Uh, but yeah, a month either side, you're losing. So delay anything you would have done on the mainland by a month. Anything that, any advice that comes out of River Cottage, give us six weeks. Because <laughs> it's a different world. We cannot listen, we cannot listen to you about anything. Uh, but at least a month. Yeah, delay everything by at least a month. And don't feel bad about, well, obviously you do feel bad because your compost is very expensive, but um, try not to feel bad about getting caught out by full spring because we've all done it. Mm. We've all done it. We've all seen two days of sun and been like, yes. Um, with the winters we have up here, I think we can forgive ourselves for getting a bit excited. Um, I've done it. I've, I've got semi in squash plants. I've planted about 80 squash plants <laughs> in my living room. So I'll be trying to force them off in a few weeks because I don't know. <laughs> My partner's gonna kill me. Um, it's really cute now because you know, just they're not even got true leaves yet. They've just got the oh, I don't get it. But soon they're gonna, yeah. So we've all done it. We've all gotten too excited and started early. We live and we learn. Well, or we don't. I'll probably do the same thing next year. <laughs> Is it possible to take part in all of this if you don't have a crop? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't have a crop. No, no, no. Absolutely. This can apply to. Gardens is going to apply to balconies. Sure. Yeah, you know, this is not this is not CAGS, this is not SEC, this is nothing like that. This is just trying to get growers mm. interested and growing and move us slightly towards community sufficiency and slightly sure. away from dependence on... But that was the sort of the bit that I'd sort of yeah. thought you were doing. It would be brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. And then I'm looking down at all the different seminars, because I was going to come to the ones at the college. Yeah. And, but it's such a long way to go around already come back here and and they were all for like crofts and polytunnels and and I'm thinking maybe this isn't actually in 
at somebody. This is for anyone scale. that wants to come, honestly. This is for anyone that wants to come along. If you've got two raised beds and a pot, mm -hmm. you're more than welcome. If you've got 18 acres, you're more than welcome. Uh, yeah, no, we don't, we don't differentiate. We're not too worried about that. Um, on, on that subject, we've got Sarah coming back next week and maybe the opportunity to go into detail a bit more on, on certain areas. Are there, are there any requests? We've been giving talks in town. We've had, um, we have had requests, and therefore we've done an evening on polycarbs and polytunnels. We've done an evening on raised bed growing and composting. There's composting in the Hebrides. It is on beast as well. Um, slightly different to composting on the mainland. So there's all sorts of stuff, that sort of stuff. What we have, I was talking to Chris before everyone arrived. What we have found is the more we narrow it, obviously the fewer people arrive, and we don't really want exclude people, we kind of want to include people. Um, so we, with our initial evenings, we tend to cast the net wide, you know, come one, come all, the instructions growing in the Hebrides in any form, under glass, in the open, on a croft, on a windowsill. Um, and then from here, we can we can certainly start to go a bit narrower. And if there are any requests, if anyone would like to talk about anything specific next week. That on composting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No worries. That will get the threat to the rats. You know, if you don't have meat or dairy, and you should be fine. Oh, that being said, um, somebody who will rename nameless John um, composted an entire sheep last year. Yeah. And when I used to tell this yarn, I used to be really careful about not naming names. And then he came to one of our talks and went, "I composted a sheep." <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, they, so to avoid rats, I've got a compost heap, and I'd see no rats. Okay. And, um, Meat and dairy, avoid them. Um, turn it. So I can always yeah. order vegetables, you know. Absolutely, yeah. Turn. Garden waste oh. and yeah, hedge clippings and grass cuttings and all sorts. And yeah, there's a. It's not a very fine or specific art, but there is a bit of an art to composting, especially up here, because everything's a little bit different up here. Um, so yeah, we can definitely we can definitely talk about that next week if there's interest in that. That's not a problem. I've not seen any earthworms up. We have flatworms up here, which I've learned through this because I didn't know that either. Yeah, um, we've got them on our crop. Yeah. I, I didn't know they existed until I we found them on our crop. They're awful. Yes, I got, I got this question the very first seminar I gave months ago. I got this question. Um, why have I got no worms? They're the worms as well. The hmm? New Ze I think they're the New Zealand flatworms. They, they are. Yeah. They, they, eat yeah. they do, yeah. It's sad. It's very sad. <laughs> it's very sad. I'm it's usually very. Uh, no, you know, it's all the web, everything's got its place, but New Zealand flatworms can just, they can do one. <laughs> I don't like them at all. So I, I used to work for a mushroom farm, I wondered about your microbiology around here. What what kind of mushrooms do grow in here, if any? I'd be interested in that, but like obviously mushroom farming, you create your own substrate. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be interested in that in the future, if yeah. there's people doing mushroom stuff up here. It's not actually something I'm familiar with, but I'm more than happy to find out. And, yeah, well, definitely. Norman and Gary Bard. Norman who grows just about absolutely anything you can think of in Giddy Barn. Okay. He's certainly been growing mushrooms. All right. There. Do you know do you know what I mean? I I know I heard of Norman maybe, but I don't know the place. What was the place? He's in Giddy Barn in the next village down. Okay. And uh, he's growing asparagus and all sorts of stuff there in Giddy Barn. Um, um it's amazing what he grows. I've got a lot of chilies didn't you last year? Eh? I've lots of chilies. Yeah, chilies. Yeah. 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 They tried some mushrooms last year where you get the spores in little dowling. Yeah. Yes, and you put them in. Put them in a log and didn't do anything. Yeah. Didn't see a thing. No. Yeah. They take a while. Still got More them. than a year. Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. They usually sure. require a, like a stratification, <laughs> so they might need a cold season and a warm season. Uh, right. To take off. Um, well, yeah. I wasn't expecting that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The box is small enough. I've still got the log. Yeah. <laughs> you can still <laughs> try the log. Put it in the Get out of that usually serves to kickstart it. Oh. You can do it with a tree seedlings as well. Um, huh. Yeah. 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 Honestly, uh, a couple of years ago I got some really nice apricots and I went to see if I could grow an apricot tree from a stone and it turns out I can. And now I've got an apricot tree and I didn't think it through because when I get it, it's like, it's here. <laughs> ah, I'm going to have to spend 20 grand on a, on a polycarp to house yeah. this tree. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah.
Yeah, that shell picks up. That's great. Oh, oh cool. brilliant. We got half a dozen of them. Wow. Yeah. Still <laughs> is everything in big. Yeah, yeah, why not? Nice. That's like seed saving. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's something that you do do. I've tried to do it in the past, but I'm rubbish because I leave everything too long and I don't label things and like mm -hmm. my peas have all mites in them or, or whatever go moldy. So yeah, that that could be interesting. Yeah, seed saving is great. I mean, obviously it's, it, it cuts down on your expenditure over the years, or it should. I'm still not to be trusted with some cattle. Mm -hmm. um, I like I like seed catalogs a bit too much. Uh, but yeah, we have a little bit of seed saving. Um, it's, a, it's a great practice. And seed swapping as well. Um, what we've noticed a lot in these seminars is we're starting to see miniature communities form in of themselves, which is fantastic because hopefully a few of you tonight won't know each other and you will by the end of these talks. And we've certainly seen that in town. Um, a few of them have arranged their own seed swap now in a completely independent way, which I was one arranged in a Brains Point like a few weeks fantastic. back. Fantastic. Yeah, it's a bit of a Brilliant, yeah. And seed swaps are brilliant because. Seeds tend to, you can, you can buy a packet of like two or five thousand. <laughs> it's like, great, I've always wanted to grow five thousand turnips. Um, and we've all got too many because we all get a bit excited for some cow. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> never done with that. I stay in the next village here in Harvest uh, and I'm north facing my garden on the hillside. In fact, you can see my house from here. Uh, so, you know, in the uh, above the sea, you know, where there's salt and everything else grow, uh, blowing in salt water. But I uh, have a, a good shelter belt, which is grown. Uh, the, it grows about a metre a year. Excellent. And it's Oleria, you know, yeah. and uh, it's fantastic. It's evergreen, um, grows very, very well in, in this weather. Uh, and it's more a problem to keep it down than it is to <laughs> do anything else. In fact, yeah. I get John Hamilton to come and take a metre off the top of it every year, you know. And he'll be very pleased because he puts it straight in his compost bin. <laughs> yeah, he, he gets most of his compost out of my garden, Excellent. I think, he by, does. <laughs> by taking all my cuttings away. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a fantastic incredible. option. Um, yeah. Most kind of willows are similarly good. They obviously it's not as thick, which I think is yeah. more edgy. Yeah, I mean, mine's been in for over 20 years, uh, nice. so it's, it's very well established, but yeah. uh, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it would. Yeah. Um, things uh, like your sea buckthorn and your gorse and whatnot are all really yeah. good options for where we are as well, just because they're so hardy. Um, some are a little bit more difficult to establish, but once they are... Yeah, and it self-seeds it everywhere as well, so you find O'Leary growing in the middle of my patio. It's seed and seeds between the slabs and the patio even. So you get plenty um, seeds for, or bits for growing, you know, yeah. for growing on. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Never expanding. I, I bought these originally from the shrub stall that was up in Tolsta, mm -hmm. uh, where they used to actually grow them. So they were grown from scratch here in the Western Isles. Mm -hmm. uh, Which is the best that you possibly can get. Yeah, yeah, yeah so sure. they were very, very good. Yeah, I think we've got, I mean, sort of we trust do a version of that now, they'll grow plants to sell yeah. that have been locally germinated and grown on locally. Mm -hmm. um, and anything that has been grown to our condition is going to have a bit of a better chance. Um, and that's true of a lot of people like to order, and it's, it's a great thing to get ahead, um, order little plug plants and whatnot. But if you're ordering a plug plant from Devon <laughs> and it lands up in Lewis, you're setting yourself up for heartbreak quite often because they're not. They're, they're, they're just, they've not evolved, they've not been grown to our specific and somewhat yeah. harsh climate. Well, if, so. if anybody wants cuttings, you know, they can definitely come to mine and <laughs> take as many cuttings as you want, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Same is true of my willow. If anyone wants willow cuttings, <laughs> see me after this. We've, we've been eyeing up some neglected willows just sort of on the roadside, so we'll definitely catch you up on that. <laughs> we have um, plenty of horse here. Set. So it's either fresh or it's six months old or a year old, t tons. Fantastic. So the reason I was going to mention that, but also how important is it getting Aniwonia onto the ground? Because I was brought up in the northeast of England in the mining community and literally horse muck was piling onto everyone's gardens mm -hmm. every year or cow muck. And you just don't see that. 
You don't see that as much up here, no. Um, obviously, there's. I think in that case, it's probably because there's different things to use up here that are readily available. You know, traditionally, it would be the seaweed yeah. that we're not telling the police that we're harvesting. <laughs> um, but ultimately, it's all it all comes down to the same thing you're trying to achieve. You're trying to build up the soil. You're trying to add. Um, nutrients and life back into the soil after having used it. So any way you can do that, it's going to be. It's never going to be a bad thing. So yeah, yeah, shovel it wide and shovel it deep and yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing about the manure is like like you well pointed out, you've got different stages of it being rotted down. So anybody getting started, if you're wanting to plant quite quite quickly, get well rotted because otherwise it's going to burn your plants. Um, and many people have had their hearts broken. I've done this great thing, I put horse manure all around my plants, it's going to be great, and then they die. So let's not do that. Well rotted is the key here, or allow it too well rot, put it in the, the centre of your raised bed or your pool culture land or whatever it is you're doing. Um, yeah, but I think if you if you put that up on Facebook in the gardening group that you've got. You will uh, get, last year we had loads of people come out. I was going to say, you, you will be beset <laughs> by gardeners with but, feedbacks. Well, that was me really having to bag it and then people oh. pick it up. So this oh, time, no, bag it's yourself, like, there's the heat. <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh no, if people are getting something we're free from, you can at least buy yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, while willows grow well, you have to be very careful not to plant them anywhere near uh, what you're cultivating yeah. because the roots from them invade into your beds. I mean, willows are like a terrible weed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and also the foundations of your house. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they travel meters, yeah. uh, and I know the the poly uh, poly tunnels in Harvest, there in the next village. You know, when we planted them uh, for a shelter belt uh, on the roadside, along uh, the roadside, and then there was a stream, and then there was like a meter, and then inside the fence were the raised beds. Well. The raised beds within a few years were totally unusable because mm -hmm. the willows came all the way under the stream, Wild. across the meter wide thing, and up through the. Wild. Yeah, and the, yeah. you know the the raised beds had to be abandoned. Yeah, mm. so, we had a similar experience with raspberries mm -hmm. uh, on our uh, allotment we had uh, back in York, where we planted a strip of raspberries and then we had. Yeah, like a metre and then a couple of metres wide yeah. raised beds. And they were coming up the other side of the mm. raised beds yeah. and they were they were impossible to deal with. I've definitely learned something about raspberries from those. Yeah. They did good raspberries, but they were weeds. Hopefully they like raspberries. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. like raspberries, so that was fine. <laughs> yeah, they're weeds. Yeah. yeah, nice. There was a request from someone who couldn't be here tonight for something about the polytunnels, but Maybe we could broaden it so as to not scare away the planters to yeah. kind of season extension and tunnel generally. Yeah, not problem at all. We can definitely do that. Taking bits of your leftovers. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. That's no worries. Um, definitely don't want to don't want to exclude anyone. Don't yeah. want to see anyone to see. Oh, they're talking about polytunnel. Because yeah. <laughs> um, until this year, I mean, I'm hoping to have one this year. I didn't have one either. Um, so yeah, yeah, we can definitely talk about extending the season. That's not a problem. Just, just, just one more thing, this yeah. is about the worms and flatworms. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people think that they don't have flatworms, but you almost definitely do. Um, a little experiment, which is not a fun experiment, it's a horrible experiment, is get some black plastic or a feed bag or a compost bag or something, just put it somewhere on your lawn, maybe near some, something sheltered, leave it overnight, come out the next day and lift it up and just count how many you get under there. It's, they seem to like going under plastic for shelter. so. If you want to try and, it's it's very, very limited what you can do, but someone that you can gather them, they just put them in bottles of water or salt or something. Trying to feed my chickens and they didn't like what they had. No, yeah. I trust us. Now they didn't like them. That's um, like enjoyed them a bit more, but. Oh, uh, chickens are meant to be pest control. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't find any ordinary worms in a garden anymore. You know, it used to be every stone you lifted here, especially when we were young and we went trout fishing. The regular thing to use was uh, worms out of the garden. It's almost impossible to find a worm there. Yeah, they, they have a real impact on night crawlers. That's the big one, just because they tend to travel across the surface at night, which is when the flat ones are there. Um, I mean, we discovered them when we did camping, lifted a little 10 gram 
sheet and just go yeah. down. Oh, but there were also earthworms under there, so they are here. Little. They were small. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if, um, if you do, if you are able to impact population, you might get. They exist in a sort of weird, unstable equilibrium where they get population sort of booms and crashes, so it's possible you might be able to make a local impact. But again, it's just one of those things that you know, sort of bashing them and there's these horrible slimy things that you didn't know existed. Um, I've seen uh, people say things like, you know, um, looking, that someone was looking for comp compost or something recently, they're mm -hmm. saying, you know, somewhere that, that's careful about flatworms, and it is kind of like, well, the, you know, they're beyond people's shoes, mm -hmm. like, they're not, like, they're everywhere now, unfortunately, yeah. I don't yeah. think there's a lot you can do about that. Um, yeah, but that's, that's a bit of a depressing point, isn't it? <laughs> Seeds of Scotland mm -hmm. come very highly recommended. They're all open pollinated and, yeah. and grown in the Highlands. So with any luck, the seeds you're getting will be more adapted to where we are. Um, but yeah, seed saving is a great way just to save a fortune in the long run. Um, but also to preserve the best of you know what you enjoy. Uh, it's your it's your projects. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, we call it about a day at that. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you